So I want to thank everyone for coming to the Douglas Community Garden. If this is your first time here, this isn't labor of love, this garden. It all started because in 2004, you'll see a tree that's just leading to the left down the end of the road. That's our Liberty tree that was planted in 1762. And it has historic significance because it was outside of the stable of Edward Bennett. And Edward Bennett was an abolitionist in Brockton. And so he would hide slaves in his stable during the day so that they could travel under the darkness, the safety of darkness on their way to freedom to Canada. So to honor Edward Bennett and his abolitionist movement, and he was a rabid abolitionist, you know. Um, he, he, was, he would go down to Island Grove in Abington and he would say, well, I got a delivery of wool coming this after at three o'clock and I better get back. And he would come back and the wagon would pull up and the wool would be on the top and the slaves would be underneath and he would hide them in the stable. So Frederick Douglass came to Brockton and spoke at that Liberty Tree. We think around 1840, 41, 42. We don't have any newspaper accounts. But remember, he was born 200 years ago in 1818. When he escaped as a slave, he lived in New Bedford, Massachusetts, starting in 1838. And some of the first free black men that he ever met were New Bedford um, shipbuilders. So that's why in this garden we honor Amilcar Cabral, who is um, a beloved freedom fighter of Cape Verde. At the end of his life, Frederick Douglass served as the minister to Haiti, and he was so upset with the American treatment of Haiti that he resigned his position um, in, in opposition to what America was doing. We know that in 1845, Frederick Douglass went to Ireland and stood next to the great Daniel O'Connell, the great liberator, the emancipator, and fought for the rights of Irish Catholics um, to vote. And we know that he stood next to Susan B. Anthony and helped women get the franchise for the first time to vote. So this speech was given to a group of lady abolitionists in Rochester, New York. It cost 12 cents to go see the speech. But he, he chose a topic how can I celebrate the 4th of July that's coming up when we still have slavery in the United States of America? Remember, he fought as an abolitionist from about 1840 until the Civil War ended and the Emancipation Proclamation um, was issued. So about 25 years he fought for um, freedom of slavery. So as we read this speech today, we may not have slavery as we knew it then in the 1860s, but I want you to be thinking about some of the things that keep us from being free and keep us from the being the best that we can be. Do we have policies in the United States of America that keep our children fed? Do we have policies that educate them to the best of our ability? Do we have policies that are welcoming towards the immigrants who settled our country a hundred years ago and are coming today? Are we tolerant of different religious, whether it be uh, people who are Jews, people who are Muslim? All of these things lead to the concept of freedom and democracy. And so as we read this speech, that is, I think, what we need to focus on. He's a man that was way before his time, Frederick Douglass. Everybody knows his saying that is, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. But he also said when people were discriminating against the Chinese who were immigrating here, the wings of the American Eagle are broad enough and strong enough to shelter all who enter here. So a lot of the things that he says are really pertinent even today. So the way this speech goes, it's 44 paragraphs. We have some people who have translated a paragraph in advance because they'd like to read that paragraph in the language of their ancestors, in the language of the people who immigrated here to build this country. And we have some that are in English. So there's no rhyme nor reason to it, except if you see somebody's name on the speech, that probably means that they translated it ahead. 
So we're going to get started with um, paragraph number one. So is, does everyone have a copy of the speech? Come, come up underneath the rock and get a copy of the speech. If you see a name next to it, it means somebody has um, translated it and is going to speak. If you don't see a name next to it, then you can come up and just read it um, out loud. This microphone is through the courtesy of our um, Brockton Community Access, BCA, our cable company. So it will record our reading, but it does not amplify. So you have to use your outdoor um, voice again. So again, all of the people from the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association, thank you for coming. This could not be possible without the funding of Mass Humanities, so we thank Mass Humanities for their funding. And we also thank the Good Samaritan Medical Center. They are celebrating their 50th year in operation, and one of the things they wanted to do was support us in our event. So we have a wonderful woman, my good friend Daryl, who is going to come up and read paragraph number one. And then we'll go right down to two, three, four, and begin. What to the slave is the 4th of July? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. The meaning of the 4th of July for the Negro. Frederick Douglass, July 5th, 1852. Mr. President, friends and fellow citizens, the task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a 4th of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way, for it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plant plantation from which I escaped is considerable, and the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is, to me, a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. Thank you, Dan. Jodia, nuap celebre. 4 juillet, n'a fait anniversaire indépendance pays et puis liberté politique wap joui en tant que citoyen. Jou sa pou ou, se tankou fait pak pou pep bondia. Dat joune, jodia fe toune nan yon moment kete yon jou delivran. Pour célébration ça a mac commencement yo lot lan non existence pays a li fait pense tout que république pep américain fondia gen soixante six ans Citoyen, moins content pays ou la jeune. Ça veut dire, lit toujours la période en an nan France li. Mouen ap répété en kom content se konsa liye. Genya an pil le soa nan payol sa e nan bezwen an pil le soa en ban période difficile nous prajouen pi devant. Thank you, Mary. All right. My name is Marcelina. I'm with Crialas and Leaders. I'm going to read the third paragraph. Um, Caros cidadãos, a sim história é que 76 anos atrás, o povo deste país era sujeito britânico. O estilo e título do seu povo soberano, no qual você agora se glorifica, não nasceu então. Você estava sob a coroa britânica. Seus pais estimaram o governo inglês como governo de origem. A Inglaterra, com pátria, embora distante da sua casa, impõe no exercício das suas prerrogativas parentais a seus filhos coloniais tais restrições, encargos e limitações que, em seu julgamento maduro, julgam sábia, correta e adequada. Thank you. Thank you. So I am going to do paragraph four, 
And then paragraph five, I just saw Shalo pull up crazily in back of me, so I think he'll be just in time for five. But your fathers, who had not adopted the idea of the infallibility of government and the absolute character of its acts, presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and justice of some of those burdens and restraints. They went so far as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive, and altogether such as ought not to be quietly submitted to. I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. Feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, respectful, and loyal manner. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn. So Mr. Douglas is talking about the founding fathers who decided it was time to break from England because they did not agree with policies. So I see Charlot Lucien is here from the Haitian Artist Assembly, and he is going to read paragraph number five. Bonsoir. Oppression, domination, c'est bagaille qui fait même monde qui a une sagesse lever campé. Zancet ou yo te perdi patience. Yo te vin ouet tete yo tan kou victime yon situation tellement grave que yo pap jwenn solution si yo rete en bas pays l'Angleterre. Garçon vayan ap toujou jwenn solution nan situation oppression ak domination. C'est là que l'idée séparer colonie ou ak couronne gouvernement métropole là te prend naissance. Jodi a c'est comme ça nou kapab wèl. Te gen moun ki te timide, ki pa te d'accord. Se avèk an pil enerji ki yo te eksprime dezako ak opozisyon yo. Men malgre tout bri, tout kont, mal taye sou lide indépendans peyyan, machin ou lo revolisyon an te desan pou l trenen tout res peyyi de yel. Hi, I'm Tina Cardoso. I'm going to do paragraph number six. No dia de dois de julho de 1776, o antigo Congresso Continental para o desalento dos amantes de tranquilidade e dos adorados de propriedade revistiu aquela terrível ideia, contudo, a autoridade de ascensão nacional. Elas fizeram isso na forma de uma resolução. Raramente encontramos resoluções elaboradas em nossos dias cuja transparência é de tudo é de tudo igual. Resolvidos que essas colônias unidas sejam e de direito deveriam ser estados livres e independentes, que são abolis, ah, abolvidas de tudo lealdade à coral britânica. Good afternoon, my name is Cheryl Lee. I'm going to do paragraph seven. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded, and today you reap the fruits of their success. That the freedom gained is yours, and you therefore may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history, the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Hi, my name is Catherine Bradfield, and I'll be doing paragraph eight uh, in Gaelic. Serani Kyolta, Nil me arnien lo, mass on ertakta on pabulcha, Bayid na signers on dervu na shirsha fara bra, Vishid fir moor, Freshen vur galor frama on tabert do esh moor. Nukurin che tarlu, minik lanashun ardu. Eg in almawan, a lehe de leon, nafar go firinak moor. Neil on, on point as vil me diaka con vacant. Erhu quinta on cuid is mo far. Argus fos ni fedelam on machnev, and niv is more denis lu 
uh, admiration. V. Shid Saitsman Tir Gahori, Agus Lekra, Agus Ervaharin Shid, Agus Unpunchable Deoctig, Shid Begme Eg Anta Lalat Kun Omus Aguivna. Citoyen, Mbap Mande ou pas qu'un respect pour moun qui font des pays. Moun qui te si une déclaration indépendance tant et brave. Aucune chaîne réalisation ça mérite admiration nous. C'était des moun qui dégain vision. Ils tiraient mes pays yo et c'était bon patriote. Moi je voulais pour te coller avec nous aujourd'hui hein, pour nous remémorer garçon vaillant ça yo pour bon travail yo t'ai fait sous principe yo t'ai campé yo. Hi, I'm Donna Costa. They were peacemen, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They showed forbearance, but they knew its limits. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. You may well cherish the memory of such men. They were great in their day and generation. Their solid manhood stands out the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. Uh, I'm Shayla, I'm gonna read 11. How circumspect, exact, and appropriation, oh, appropriationate were all their movements. How unlike the populations of an hour, their statementship looked beyond the past the passing moment and stretched away in strength into the distant future, fully appreciating the hardship to be encountered, firmly believing in the right of their cause. Wisely measuring the terrible odds against them, your fathers, the fathers of the Republic, laid the cornerstone of the, nat of the national su superstructure, which has risen and still rises in grandeur around you, of this fundamental work. This day is the anniversary. Mes affaires, si j'ai des affaires ici aujourd'hui, est avec le présent. Le foie accepté avec Dieu et sa cause et ça qui m'aime vivant maintenant. Nous avons fait avec le passé seulement que nous l'avons fait utilisant. Du présent est au l'avenir. Maintenant est le foie, le foie important. Vos pères vivent, mourent et fait votre travail et très bien même si vous vivez et vous mourrez et vous obligez faire vos travail vous n'avez pas le droit de faire un joie la portion d'un enfant travail de vos pères à moins que vos enfants jouissent d'un bon travail Vous n'avez vous pas le droit de faire gaspillage, durement gagner de femmes de vos pères pour couvrir vos indolences. Although I may have spoken in a way that you did not understand before, so let me say again, I am Charles Lucien with the Haitian Artist Assembly of uh, Massachusetts. I'm specially pleased to be part of this because history tells us that when Frederick Douglass went in Haiti between 1889 and 1891 as the first black ambassador, he worked to prevent the U.S. from occupying and using a piece of Haiti as a naval base. So we owe this debt of gratitude to Frederick Douglass as Haitian. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask why I am called upon to speak here today. What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude 
for the blessings resulting from your independence to us. Labadena Manavarda Sira Jonas Druzinskis. Good day, my name is John Druzinskis. And I'll be reading uh, a couple of passages in Lithuanian. Ardevu Tavo Labal Ir Musulaboi Kad Tesingas Atsakimas Galetu Bute Tesinge Grajintas Shos Klausimas Tada Mana Ujdotis Butu Lengve O mana nasta buvo lengve e maloninga. Betokia nere valstibe. Ashtai sakau ab lengindo skirtuma type musu. As netraukas is sha shlovinga jubilea. Yusu ne proclosamibe at lede de jere at suma tarp musu. I also like to take this opportunity uh, while we're talking about freedom and independence. Uh, the Lithuanian community here in Brockton and actually around the world and back in the old country are celebrating um, 100 years of independence. The actual Independence Day was February 16th. Uh, that's the independence from Tsarist Russia. So, Achilabai. And if you want to say thank you in Lithuanian, just pretend you're sneezing. Achu. <laughs> the blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak today? Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains heavy and grievous yesterday are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. Hi, I'm Terry Lindy, and I'm going to read 17. My subject, then fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day from the slave's point of view, standing here, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine. I do not hesitate to, to declare with all my soul, that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on the 4th of July. Whether we turn to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds himself, herself, to be false to the future. And what, I'm just going to finish by saying that. Both my grandparents were immigrants. One came from Holland as a Dutch Jew, and my grandmother was an Italian who came on the same boat as my grandfather. And they met in 1913 and came to this country, to Boston. So I just want to say that in the culture of what's going on today, I'm happy to see everybody come together. Thanks. My name is Pat Foley. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce, with the, all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command. And yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice or who is not at heart a slaveholder shall not confess to be right and just. I'm amazed when I read that how much work has to be done in this country. Thank you all for being here. Hi, my name is Jan Brassel, and I'm proud to read number 19. I fancy I hear some of my audience say, 
It is just circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists fail to make a favorable impression on the public mind. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit, where is all plain? There is nothing more to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? Must I under undertake to prove that the slave is a man? The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of the laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which, if committed by a black man, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this? but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being. Southern statute, books are covered with enactments forbidding. Under severe fines and penalties, the teaching of the slave to read or to write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beast of the field, then I may consent to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, then I will argue with you that the slave is a man. Criolos Unidas is happy to be here. We're an organization of unity, and it's nice to be with you all doing this um, uh, Frederick Douglass, what is unity? I mean, I'm sorry, what is... Um, July for the Negro. I just want to say that Cape Verde Independence Day is July 5th as well. So it's, it's great to be doing this. It's perfect timing. Thank you. Hello again. I don't think I introduced myself. My name is Magali or Maggie Pinney. I represent the Family Center, Community Connections of Brockton, um, uh, Brockton Parents Magazine, and the Massachusetts Association for Gifted Education. And Brockton Kids Count. Three kids. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that, while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that, while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, digging gold in California, capturing the whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, living, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian's God, and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty, that he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is it too involving a doubtful application of the principles of justice hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans to show that men have a natural right to freedom? To do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What, am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes, to rob them of their liberty? to work them without wages, 
to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with a lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auction, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their, their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employments for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. I'd just like to mention the shirt that I'm wearing here. Um, I think everyone here has heard of the uh, group The Grateful Dead. The shirt was actually in 1992 when Lithuania uh, first had a Olympic team. The Grateful Dead uh, designed uh, the, the basketball shirts. This is not a replica, but it's, it's similar to what The Grateful Dead did. So, um, and actually on the back it says 2004. Uh, that's when the Lithuanians won their bronze medal and they gave our dream team a run for their money. I'll uh, read this paragraph in Italian. Che cosa quindi ha lasciato a discutere? E che la schiavito non è divina? E che Dio non ce l'ha fatta? E che il nostro sacerote hanno tutto? E che blasfemia in quel pensiero? Ciò che dis humano non più divino. Chi può credere un cosa come questo? Il tempo per questa discussione è passato. Since we're doing little introductions, my connection to the community garden is that for a number of years I worked as the director and then a volunteer at the Brockton Church and Community After School program, which is over at Central United Methodist Church, and the kids in that program painted some of these lovely rocks. At a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind and the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened the conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. And its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. I know most of you here, but I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Mark Lindy, and I'm wearing a hat from my favorite Cuban restaurant in Jamaica Plain. My dad came to this country. He was born in Cuba, and he came here uh, when he was 12. Someday I'll get to go back and see where he was born. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty an unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciations of tyrants brass-fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all of your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without rival. Take the American slave trade, which is especially prosperous just now and carried on in all the large towns and cities 
in one half of this confederacy. In several states, this trade is a chief source of wealth. It is called the internal slave trade. In order to divert from the hour with which the foreign slave trade is contemplated. That trade has long since been denounced by this government as piracy, as an execrable traffic. To arrest it, this nation keeps a squadron at immense cost on the coast of Africa. Everywhere in this country, it is safe to speak of this foreign slave trade as a most inhuman traffic opposed alike to the laws of God and man. It is, however, a notable fact that, while so much execration is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade, the men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation and their business is deemed honorable. Behold the practical operation of this internal slave trade the American slave trade, sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what is a swine driver? I will show you a man, a man drover. They inhabit all of our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. And you will see one of these human flesh jobbers armed with pistols, whip, and bowie knives driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave market at New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along and the inhuman wretch who drives them. Hear his savage yells and his blood-chilling oaths as he hurries on his affrighted captives. There see the old man with locks thinned and gray. Cast one glance, if you please, upon that young mother whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun her briny tears falling on the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, that girl of 13 weeping, yes, weeping, as she thinks of the mother from whom she has been torn. The drove moves tardily. Heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strength, and suddenly you hear a quick snap like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank. The chain rattles simultaneously. Your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way to the center of your soul. That crack you have heard was the sound of the slave whip. The scream you heard was from the woman you saw with the babe. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child and her chains. That gash on her shoulder tells her to move along. Now, I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself earlier. My name is Arnie Danielson, and I am the president of Brockton Arts. Paragraph 32. Follow the drove to New Orleans. Attend the auction. See men examined like horses. See the forms of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this drove sold and separated forever, and never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from that scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun can you witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking? Yet this is but a glance at the American slave trade as it exists at this moment in the United States. Fellow citizens, this murderous traffic today in active operation to this boasted republic in the solitude of my spirit I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the south I see the bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets, where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep, and swine, knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest ties ruthless, ruthlessly broken to gratify the lust 
caprice, and rapacity of the buyers and sellers of men. I also like to mention that I, I'm, a, um, I'm actually a second generation American, uh, United States. Um, my mom was born here, my dad was born in Lithuania. I, lot of, I learned a lot of things from my dad and um, one of the things I learned was uh, he didn't know a word of English when he came over. He learned all of that um, over a matter of time and uh, one thing I learned from him was the most important word in English before you learn anything else is toilet. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ann Borgad, and I serve on the board of the Adult Learning Center, where people come from all over the world to learn the English language. By an act of the American Congress, not yet two years old, slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form. Mason and Dixon's line have been obliterated. New York has become Virginia, and the power to hold, hunt, and sell men, women, and children as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. Hi, I'm Linda Karp. I'm from Bridgewater, and I just thought this was so relevant to today and important to read. The power is coextensive with the star-spangled banner and American Christianity. Where these go may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these are, man is not sacred. He is a bird for the sportsman's gun. By that most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and person of every man are put in peril. Your broad Republican domain is hunting ground for men. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president, your secretary of state in force as the duty you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. Not fewer than 40 Americans have, within the past two years, been hunted down and without a moment's warning, hurried away in chains and consigned to slavery and excruciating torture. Some of these have had wives and children dependent on them for bread, but of this, no account was made. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. My name is Jewel Wilson. I'm a member of Messiah Baptist, which is next door, and I can, I'm old enough to remember segregation. For a black man, there are neither law nor justice, humanity nor religion. The fugitive slave law makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judges who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery and five when he fails to do so. The oath of any two villains is sufficient under the held black enactment to send the most pious and exemplary black man into the remorse, morpheless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing he can bring no witness for himself. The minister of American justice is bound by the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetually told. Let it be thundering around the world that in tyrant killing, king hating, people loving, democratic, America, uh, Christian American, American, the seat of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and impalpable bribe and are bound in deciding in the case of a man's liberty to hear only his accusers. Now, if you will bear with me, I'm going to see if I can get this technology to work. So hold on one sec, because one of the um, important speeches that Frederick Douglass also gave was called the Composite Nation. And he gave that speech in Boston when there was discussion about Chinese immigration. And so a very um, wise man who is a doctor of philosophy at Boston University 
translated one of these um, paragraphs for us in Mandarin Chinese because he was thought it was important that that language be heard because of that connection. So of course now what I have to do is figure out where that file is and here it is. So I found it and I'm going to play it. Okay, I'll be reading number 39. Americans, your republic politics, not less than your republican religion, are flagrantly inconstant. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure, excuse me, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three millions of your countrymen. You hurl your anathems as the crowded headed tyrants of Russia and Austria and pride yourselves on your democratic institutions while you yourself consent to be the mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppression from abroad, honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, cheer them, toast them, salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives from your own land you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. You discourse eloquently on the dignity of labor, yet you sustain a system which, in its very essence, casts a stigma upon labor. You can bear your bosom to the storm of British artillery to throw off a three-penny tax on tea, and yet wring the last hard-earned farthing from the grasp of the black laborers of your country. You profess to believe that, of one blood, God made all nations of men to dwell in the face of all the earth, and hath commanded all men, everywhere, to love one another, yet you notoriously hate and glory in your hatred. All men whose skins are not colored like your own. Pas une justice pour nèg noir en Amérique. Religion pas wè yo nan gros livre la. Yo pas même considéré au tant que chrétien vivant. Règlement sur esclave marron pas ba yo aucune chance. Li même recommande récompenser juge qui condamné yo. Yon juge américain touché 10 dollars par tête esclave, li retourner ba met li alors que li recevoir seulement 5 dollars s'il pas arrivé tourner yo marron ba propriétaire. Témoignage de tout fait assez pour voyer yon bon vieux grain nèg noir dans l'enfer tête chargé l'esclavage. Parole li pa gen valeur. Li pa capable mener moun pour témoigner pour li dans tribunal. La justice dans pays américain ba yon seul parti droit pour le parler, mais li toujours prend parti pour moun qui fait abio. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as a base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad. It corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing. And by and a byword to a mocking earth. Be warned, a horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of a youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy, crush and destroy it forever. Good evening. Uh, my name is Fritz Duchesne and I'm uh, from the Haitian Artist Assembly of Massachusetts. Um, allow me to say in conclusion, notwithstanding 
the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation. I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. I therefore leave off where I began with hope, while drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions. My spirit is cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and throw it round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time was when such could be done. But a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arms of commerce have borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. The space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on the other. In the fervent aspirations of William Lloyd Garrison, I say, and let us, and let every heart join in saying it, God speed the day when human blood in every clime be understood the claims of human brotherhood and each return for evil good, blow for blow, that day will come all feuds to end and change into a faithful friend each foe. So you can see as we read this speech, every one of us brings a different part of our personality and a bit different part of our background to it. And each paragraph rings true even today when we talk about mothers being separated from children, when we talk about the earth is shrinking and to go from Boston to London is but a day's um, travel. And when we talk about is there going to be a day when all of us have that dream, the pursuit of liberty and justice for all. So as we stand in this garden and we see the representation of some of the cultures here in Brockton, I think it's really amazing that we read this speech. You know, there are about eight or ten cities in Massachusetts who read this speech out loud every year. But I'm very proud for, about Brockton because we are the only city in the Commonwealth that reads this speech in the language of our ancestors.